Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, including representatives, one or more from the Russian Embassy, a very welcome here tonight in the Central Library. We have a very special occasion tonight, um, a special event, um, which Tom will be introducing to you. Um, before we will be uh, enlightened how to deal with the President Putin, um, we will see the birth of a new center of literature, science and social discourse. And before we do that, uh, Tom will tell more about it and I will fill in later. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm Tom van der Lankhuis, Director of Writers Unlimited, which is an annual literature festival most of you will know every year in January in The Hague. And it started 20 years ago with a mission that still stands. We involve literature in the social discourse, social engagement, not that of the writer giving answers, but that of the writer posing the right questions. So we have been bringing the writers in the middle of discussions around developments in the world, globalization, migration, uh, issues of identity, religion, etc. We've always, always tried to bring multiple perspectives into the roundtable discussions. Views from different cultural backgrounds, different parts of the world. And now, the fact that we're here started more than four years ago when we started to collaborate with the, the Hague Public Library, doing programs, monthly programs here. At first, those were programs with international writers and poets in Writers Unlimited, the series, and later we started Science Unlimited, the series, in which we try to involve scientists in these debates and combine writers and science, scientists in one panel. This is what you're going to witness tonight. In all these years, uh, the Hague Public Library also developed their literary program, and they were titled Literature Late Night, which is on what's happening in Dutch literature. We are convinced that bringing in multiple perspectives from various disciplines, more than seeking opposing opinions, as you see in debates, classical debates, if you bring together these uh, perspectives and disciplines, you get closer to answers to questions that rise in our world today. That's what you try to do in every program. There's a question that we share and we want to get closer to an answer. So this will be a common departure point for this newly made Center for Literature, Science and Social Discourse, a very long, long title so far. In due time, this initi initiative will grow into a house of words, a center for the free word. We will invite national and international institutions in The Hague uh, and NGOs in our city to contribute to that center, to come with their own ideas for programs or questions that need to be tackled and come with their expertise. So in the future, this center will have a huge number of programs uh, in a month, and the center will also include a residency for a writer in residence from abroad, so that we can host writers in our international city. But for now, the next step is going to be to create a greatly varied program from September this year. Then you'll see in the news that a lot of things will be happening here in this very place. So, we'll keep you posted on this. Charles. Thank you. Uh, my name, by the way, is Charles Nordham. I am happy to be the director of this central library. And I'm very delightful that you are here to mark the presence of the birth of this child, so that in later years you can boast and tell your grandchildren, I was there when it all started. The library has always been a place of literature, a place for debate, a place of opinions. And in my opinion, there's no better place than this for our new center. But there is still a lot of work to do. But we start tonight, and I'm very happy with it newborn. And I'm also very happy to announce that the child has been given a name. A strong indication of the name you can see on the screens here, and perhaps you can guess. If you are a bit creative, you might come up with a name we invented. Any guesses? No? 
The name of this child is B Unlimited. <laughs> and as a proud co-father, I hope this child will prosper, flourish and conquer the world. Thank you all for being the official witnesses of this moment. Thank you, Tom. Now, now that we know on the which name we work, uh, we can go to the main course of this evening, and that is the program. But after the program, to celebrate the birth, we uh, invite you for a drink and raise the glass. But for now, may I invite the guests of this evening, the two Mishas, uh, Michal Shishkin, Michal Krilas, and Oksana Cheliceva, to come on stage. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you on this very special occasion on which we're going to discuss a very hot topic dealing with Putin. And we have invited the following guests. To my right side is sitting Oksana Chelizova. She is a former uh, research journalist from the famous newspaper Novaya Gazeta, and she's now nowadays very active as a human rights activist in Ukraine. And she's the one who can give us up-to-date information because she's traveling to both sides of the conflict and uh, writing about it and reporting about it. And uh, uh, the situation is even more difficult and stranger than we might think here. Uh, to her right side is sitting Mikhail Shishkin. He is actually Russia's most famous and uh, most famous and best writer. I know it's not by heart, but I've reviewed his first uh, novel being translated into Dutch with five stars, as we've got to do it nowadays. And it's a marvelous book, which you can buy over there at the bookshop. Do it, because afterwards, <laughs> you'll understand everything about Russia and about the Russians. And to Misha's right side is sitting Adrian Jakobovic de Shechet. He is one of our um, yeah, most, he used to be one of the Dutch most important diplomats. He's been an ambassador in the UN Security Council at NATO. You've been working until, uh, uh, up till now. He is working in the uh, council, uh, the, the, how, how has it been called? The Council for Research. The Council for Research on the, on the MH17 disaster. So he also is able to tell us some so-called state secrets about dealing with Putin. Um, first, I'm going to, um, to ask Oksana. Oksana, we, we met in 2011 in the Belarusian capital, Minsk. <coughs> it was a time of uh, uh, local elections, and it was a time of huge, a huge protest movement uh, suddenly appearing. Yeah. And we, Western journalists, we all said to each other, this country is the last dictatorship of Europe. And nowadays, and I'm not going to say Russia, today's Russia is a dictatorship yet, but the situation is, is very uh, fastly changing. Uh, who is President Lukashenko nowadays, the last dictator of Europe, or is he no, going to be swallowed up by no, Moscow? No, as far as I understand now, so uh, Lukashenko is uh, one of the um, mediators for Europe with regard to Ukraine. So there's uh, his uh, uh, honorable title of being the last dictator is forgotten since long ago. And uh, to be honest, uh, even when we met in Minsk, and uh, uh, there I worked on, um, uh, as, a, as a researcher, but uh, on special request by uh, the chief editor of the Nova Gazeta, Dmitry Muratov, uh, because for me it was very important uh, to get my, to make my own impressions of the situation so that uh, to continue effective uh, lobbying for the release of um, one of their uh, arrested journalists. Um, 
by, by Lukashenko. And it was already then when I felt absolutely sarcastic, to be honest, about uh, this denomination or definition of Lukashenko as the last dictator of Europe, uh, because I thought, okay, uh, but what is, uh, what is Vladimir Putin? So wh who, would be, who would regard him as someone at some point? And what is was necessary to, to do uh, so that uh, the world opened, uh, opened their eyes? Uh, but still, the reality, so it would be a mistake uh, to think that the, re the reality of Putin's Russia and the uh, reality of Lukashenko's uh, Belarus was uh, this kind of black and white. You know, when I was leaving Minsk, I remember vividly my last encounter with uh, a taxi driver who was taking me in a taxi to the bus station. Um, and uh, he asked me uh, where I was from. I told him, honestly, that I had come there from Helsinki. Where is Helsinki? Well, so first you go to Lithuania, then to Latvia, then to Estonia, <laughs> and then to Finland. And then he kept silent for several minutes, and then he told her, okay, so it's so far away. This is a different world, and while we are staying all here, so, and for me, it was, uh, yeah, this is, it was a most, the most significant moment of uh, people being desperate. Is there a reason for, for President Lukashenko to be afraid of uh, uh, Putin? Because Putin, in a d documentary which was broadcasted on state television, I believe yesterday, uh, is supposed uh, to have said that actually all of the former Soviet Union is Russia. What does that mean? Well, uh, one thing about Europe's misconceptions uh, is also with their uh, title of our meeting. You shouldn't bother yourself to deal with Putin. So Why? You, are sh you are unfortunately, Europe is too much concentrated over identifying someone to deal with. Some years ago it was Lukashenko, now this is Putin. Okay, now this is uh, Putin's turn to become the last dictator of Europe. Or the world, I don't know. Uh, so, if you want to find a, a better way, um, the most efficient way to make relations, uh, you should deal with Belarus or with Russia, with Russians or Belarusians, but not with Lukashenko or Putin. Because Russia is a lot more complicated than Mr. Putin. C can you tell me who actually is in power in Russia? Is Definitely, it Putin I'm banned from <laughs> Russia. I can't even. Yeah, visit maybe you my should country. explain. You, 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 you <laughs> did have a Russian citizenship, but yeah. you lost it a few years ago. You no, not, technically, no? I didn't lose it uh, because uh, I remained the citizen of the Russian Federation with no Russian passport, which was stolen. Uh, in Milano on the way to the International uh, Festival of Journalism, uh, where we participated together with Alek Kashin, who had been attacked some time before the festival. A famous Russian journalist. Yes, so and I was uh, trapped in Italy and uh, Finland evacuated me. Um, and when I applied for a new Russian passport in uh, uh, Helsinki in 2011, I was denied it. So you're not allowed to go back? No. Since 2011, I am a holder of a Finnish passport. Okay. Remaining the Russian citizen. Let's go back to the nowadays conflict between Russia and Ukraine. You've been uh, active there, uh, more or less, um, more or less, as a human rights activist. What, what did you actually see there? You've been to both parties. You've been to Donetsk. You've been to Lugansk. You've been in in the Ukrainian held parts of the country. How is the situation nowadays? What is it? What, what kind of conflict is it? Is it a real war between Russia and Ukraine, <clears throat> which is going to end up in a real war between the West and Russia? Well, this is one of the uh, gravest concerns which I have had since uh, uh, the beginning of the conflict in May last year. Uh, since uh, uh, September last year, I've spent half of my time, it happened so, um, in Ukraine. 
I can now openly tell uh, who helps me to do what I'm doing there, and uh, my focus is not journalism, although I do write a lot, uh, but my focus is to bring some help to uh, people who are trapped by this conf conflict. And it is all thanks uh, to such people as Aki Kaurismiaki. Now I have his permission to open the source of, uh, um, of the funds which I have to uh, organize some humanitarian aid uh, to people in Ukraine. Uh, all civilians, all people who are trapped by the conflict, IDPs, or people who are now trapped in Donbass due to the decision taken by Kyiv uh, to stop financial, to, to stop monetary uh, payments uh, to pensioners, to, disa to the disabled people uh, from the Ukrainian state budget. So there's all this help goes to these desperate people. And I am on the side of these people. What do you think is going to happen in the, uh, the coming few months? You were talking uh, during dinner about Mariupol. It's a harbor town which probably the separatists need to, to build a corridor uh, to, to the Crimea. Do you think it's really to go, it's going to be a very tough struggle over there, probably between the separatists backed by the Russian troops? and the Ukrainian army, which, in the, which is still in a very, very bad shape? It's not only about the shape of this army, it's, only, uh, about, it's also about the shape of this uh, state and the construction of this uh, power, which remains absolutely corrupt and inefficient. This is my firm conclusion about the situation. The Ukrainian state? Yes. Uh, and uh, um, I can tell you, it's... It's an open secret, uh, so I've been writing uh, about that uh, with the Echo of Moscow, for instance, uh, that already back in September, I happened to be, uh, this is my plight, unfortunate plight, to be a mediator of some sort, and I happened to be a mediator without willing it. But in September last year, uh, when I was in um, Donetsk, I was asked by two women, two wives of two people who were fighting on different sides. One woman was uh, a wife of a captured Ukrainian officer. The other one was uh, a wife of a, a DPR militant who went missing. Uh, these two women both approached me uh, in different circumstances with the same request to help them to find their husbands. <clears throat> so there's, I couldn't promise them anything for obvious reasons. Uh, and it was my first uh, visit to Donetsk. Uh, but definitely I started to ask people around what can be done, how can I um, find some clues to the fates of these two men, once again, who fought on different sides of the conflict. The one of them remained missing, and uh, I suppose he will be never found. And this is uh, uh, this man uh, who was fighting with the DPR. The uh, Ukrainian officer was uh, found. His whereabouts were identified, and uh, uh, he was told to be um, held in the prison, in the special prison for uh, prisoners of war in Donetsk, in the former building of the security police. And then I started to ask them about the conditions, but he, uh, they told me that he would, he would be released um, one of the last. Why? Because he's the officer. And uh, the first in route to be released and to be exchanged are common soldiers because they are innocent and uh, they, must be, they must go first. The others can wait if they are officers. Okay, I started to ask them about the conditions of the imprisonment and uh, what was absolutely shocking and unexpected for me was the fact that they took a decision to open these prisons for me. And I was the last journalist, not Russian journalist. They knew precisely well that I was in opposition to Putin. Uh, they also can read and monitor the internet. They had read my articles about Chechnya and whatnot. They were absolutely aware who they were allowing to go in. So I inspected 
uh, both uh, facilities in which uh, Ukrainian prisoners of war, of war were kept. And then I asked uh, one of the chief officers, or I don't know, so they were, not with, they were without insignia, <coughs> uh, but definitely he was a militant man, um, uh, why they allowed me to see all that. They told, you know, um, we had read your articles, you definitely uh, told the truth before. We hope that you will tell the truth now. I accepted that. So they knew that I might be of absolutely different views from them, of absolutely different political stance. But uh, in order to find a solution to the problem, the most basic thing is to be able to speak the truth and uh, uh, to differentiate the facts and your assumptions and your position, uh, political views. But the most important thing which happened that day, we, and to be honest, I'm, I'm not the bravest person in the world. I, I, I do want to have a normal life, and uh, it was a bit scary for me to be brought inside a prison of militants and be surrounded by all these uh, people with arms. But they were not hostile to me, and we were talking, we were talking for really long, for more than three hours. And then the chief responsible person told, okay, Exana, okay, ah, by the way, we, uh, one of the topics which we discussed with them uh, was the topic of uh, the rules of law and Geneva Conventions. And I did that because I'm one of the authors of the uh, research into the international criminal law and its possible applicability to Chechnya. So I do know some bits about these how, how, things. How many separatists are fighting in the area? How many do you think? They, are it a few thousand people or are it tens of thousands? Because it's, it's still difficult. a picture which yeah. we can't really get clear. It's difficult to tell. Uh, so, or the groups which I personally saw, uh, they were not very numerous, but definitely uh, I, I can't estimate how many. Hmm. How many are, are, are they, they doing the real fighting? Or, or is the Russian army or the volunteers, so called volunteers from Russia, doing the real work? Uh, you know, once in Lugansk in December, I brought New Year gifts to orphans. And it happened so that exactly at that time another group of visitors came there. And it was a group of uh, um, fighters on that side. And they also brought uh, New Year gifts to the children. And uh, I had a word with their commander. Actually, I easily identified them from the rest because all the young men in the group were Slavs, uh, while this one was uh, uh, definitely from the North Caucasus. And uh, I approached him, asked him for a word, and uh, he agreed. Uh, he told me that, I, I asked him directly, okay, um, you are not a local, hmm. you are from Dagestan, definitely. Yes, he told her, uh, I'm a Dagestani, yes, but actually I lived in Rostov and Don. Uh, why are you here? And all the subordinates in his group were young Slavic boys. Mm -hmm. uh, he told her, you know, I'm against fascism. I'm against nationalism. It was his motivation. And he wasn't fighting alone. He brought his wife with him, who was a Russian woman. And actually, the person who... Uh, represented Dead Maros, Father the Frost, happened to be his wife. Mm -hmm. so, so can we say that many, that, that there are lots of people like him who, who are completely like brainwashed by uh, 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 state propaganda, which we can see every evening, even on the internet, on Russian state another television. Very complicated Fascism thing, is near Yes, it. another very complicated thing about this conflict is that there are such people also brainwashed or ideologically motivated on both sides of the conflict. Uh, there are volunteers, ideological volunteers, fighting with uh, People's Republics uh, from Italy, Spain, Slovakia, 
um, Latvia, quite many mm -hmm. European countries, there were Russian citizens fighting with the Ukrainian volunteer battalions. Uh, there are also people from Sweden, uh, people from Finland. Uh, one young guy was killed in Shirokina not long ago, uh, who was from Finland mm -hmm. and who was a, uh, a right-wing person from, uh, from Finland who fought with Azov battalion. So, you know, once again, in order to find a solution, especially in these kind of conflicts, it's very important not to simplify the situation and not to depict it in black and white. It's a lot more complicated. And uh, once again, I have uh, to state that in this kind of weird conflicts with no uh, clear <laughs> enemy identified, I am on the side of the trap people. And I'm always be with these just common people who are absolutely dissolute, who don't have any future, who are deprived of all rights, who uh, don't have any means to survive. Mm -hmm. But do you think that without Russian support in the east of Ukraine, the conflict wouldn't have been as big as it is now? Or do you think without the Russian interference, it would have been awful to you? Definitely, uh, Russian influence has, a main, well, uh, has its role. It's, uh, it will be a historical point to judge wh whether it, it is a major uh, role or one of many roles. But um, this is another difficult thing to understand, but for me it's important to state it like that. Um, there is not only one responsible in this conflict. Okay. It's okay. very important uh, not to minimize the responsibility of one nasty guy in comparison with uh, others who are seemingly more appealing, or more <coughs> understandable, or more easy to understand. Okay, thank you, Oksana. We're now going to, to watch uh, a short uh, video clip on media ideology and it's called uh, uh, Russian Occupant. Can you tell me a bit about it? Because it has been broadcasted on the internet. Or do we have to watch it and afterwards? It's better, yes, it's better to watch it first. <laughs> yes, okay, let's watch it. We can't see it. Can oh, it's here. Здравствуйте. Я русский оккупант. Это моя профессия. Так сложилось исторически. Когда-то я оккупировал Сибирь. Теперь там добывают нефть, газ, алюминий и еще много полезного. Теперь там города с детскими садами и больницами. Теперь там нельзя продавать женщин завязанку с оболиных шкурок, как это было до русских. Я оккупировал Прибалтику. Ее хутора я застроил с заводами и электростанциями. Прибалтика делала высококлассную радиотехнику и автомобили. Славилась духами и бальзамами. Меня попросили оттуда уйти. Теперь там добывают шпроты, а часть населения чистит унитазы в Европе. Я оккупировал Среднюю Азию. В голых степях я построил каналы, заводы, космодромы, больницы и стадионы. Там строили космические ракеты и самолеты, развивали промышленность, выращивали пшеницу и хлопок для всей страны. Меня попросили оттуда уйти. Теперь там развивают американские кредиты и выращивают коноплю. А часть населения уехала работать на стройке бывших оккупантов. Я оккупировал Украину. Вместе с украинцами я строил авиадвигатели корабли, танки и автомобили. Меня попросили оттуда уйти. Теперь там разрушают все, что осталось от оккупанта. При этом там не строят ничего нового, кроме бесконечных майданов и диктатуры. Да, я оккупант. И я устал извиняться за это. Я оккупант по праву рождения. Я агрессор и кровожадный урод. Бойтесь. Это я терпел зверство польских интервентов во времена смуты. Но чем закончилась их интервенция? Это я жук Москвы чтобы не отдать ее Наполеону. Но как закончил Наполеон? Это я сидел в окопе у Волоколамска, понимая, что нацистов удержать не получится. Где теперь эти нацисты? Где их проклятый Гитлер? Ко мне домой приходили все, кому не лень. Турки, англичане.
англичане, поляки, немцы, французы. Земли хватило на всех. По два с половиной метра на каждого. Поймите, мне не нужна ваша лицемерная свобода. Мне не нужна ваша гнилая демократия. Мне чуждо все, что вы называете западными ценностями. У меня другие интересы. Вежливо предупреждаю в последний раз. Не нарывайтесь. Я строю мир. Я люблю мир. Но воевать я умею лучше всех. С уважением, русский оккупант. Okay, it's clear to us, <laughs> as we know that, that Putin uh, uh, told in this TV documentary uh, yesterday that the whole former Soviet Union is Russia, then we know what to expect. It's a kind of uh, excuse for what's happening now. Um, which brings us to Adrian Jakobovic. Uh, you're a diplomat, Adrian. How to, to, to solve this problem? Because the, 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 the relationship between the West and Russia is, is worse than it has been since the end of the Cold War. It's, it's worse than in, than in the days of uh, Brezhnev. You, you, you've been stationed in Moscow in the 60s, haven't you? What does the nowadays situation remind you of? Well, unfortunately, it, it reminds rather a lot about the Soviet Union I used to live in with uh, <clears throat> the media in the hands of, uh, of a government and television, uh, which did, did not exist yet then. Then you had radio and the Pravda and the Zistia, now you have uh, television, which is really influencing a whole people. And I, I found it fascinating when I was in Russia uh, a couple of months ago, that uh, you hear the whole day by television, radio, that the fascists in Kiev have now uh, made a coup d'etat under the guidance of the CIA, who is now leading the uh, genocide in uh, eastern Ukraine, etc. And you hear that and you're reminded of the time of the Soviet Union, but you're at the same time amazed that this can happen again. And I was even more amazed. I was staying with a young Russian friend who told me the same story because that's what he had heard. An, an, an entrepreneur, as one would say, who has a little business. And uh, I told him, you know, what are you telling me about? This was really a, a people's uprising. Hundreds of thousands of people rising up against their, their rotten and, and, and corrupt society and, and leadership. Well, he said, I, I, prefer to, I prefer to believe my own propaganda rather than yours. And uh, it, so it is totally embedded in, in the people. They, they really believe that. And they believe also the, there was in the Nova Gazeta, which you were citing, there were stories about uh, soldiers, Russian soldiers who had been wounded in the war and who were interviewed by Nova Gazeta. And the man was severely wounded. We have had it One in of the New World Orthodox in in published some of it, yes. Yeah. And he said, but I know I I'm, I'm was fighting for a good cause. I was fighting for my fatherland against the fascists. So that is, that is amazing, the influence of, of the media in, in, in that country and what you can do with the media. What, what, what does it mean for uh, future negotiations? Well, indeed... Because we've you, got to you solve a very about, dangerous conflict. You were asking about solving the conflict. For solving the conflict, you need people who want to solve the conflict. And uh, I'm afraid that... Um, I don't think that uh, the Russian leadership, I'm not saying one man, but the Russian leadership, um, wants to solve that conflict unless it's on Russian terms, which are unacceptable to, in this case, Ukraine, or in another case, to Moldova, or in a third case, to Georgia. So there's no win-win situation at all? No. It, it, it cannot be solved if the other side doesn't want to solve it. You can do as if you had solved it, but you don't have solved it. We, we have worked endlessly about the conflict in Transnistria. Do you think the, the European Union has made mistakes in the beginning of Maidan? Well, because ma many in the West also accused the EU of uh, uh, having uh, completely uh, been mistaken in handling the crisis and in accepting Ukraine as, uh, as a future member of, uh, of Europe. Well, um, some individuals, I think, were uh, not dealing in a very intelligent way there and giving their support, that's sure. But uh, that, doesn't, that, that didn't make the difference for the situation at all, so it is not that important. 
Uh, certainly, if it weren't uh, Americans, but only Dutch people, so are not so important in that part of the world. Um, no, uh, I, I think that um, to, to solve the, the, the problem, uh, we need to know why the situation has arisen, and you were dealing with that a moment ago. Um, and you too, by the way, when you said that all of the former Soviet Union is Russia. Uh, Putin has now this, this, this objective, or dream, uh, to create a Euro-Asian, Euro Euro-Asiatic economic union. And he has already uh, started that, in a sense, with Kazakhstan and, uh, and Belarus. But, uh, of course, the other republics have to join, if at all possible. And some republics are more important than others. And a Eurasian Union without Ukraine is, 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 not, is, not, uh, is not possible in, in Putin's eyes. He, he often says, you know, Ukraine is, is not a country. The Ukrainians are really Russians, let's be honest about it. Uh, so the fact that the most important part, apart from Russia and the former Soviet Union, has ratified a treaty with the uh, European Union, which makes it impossible for Ukraine to join that union, is just a step too far. Uh, why is it impossible? Because uh, the Euro-Asian Euro, Euro -Asian Economic uh, Union has uh, a customs, is a customs union, so it has a tariff. And that means that if you are a member of that union, you have to follow the tariff. Now, if you have a free trade agreement with the European Union, you can't have that tariff because you should have tariffs. So the moment that you have a free trade ag agreement with the European Union, you can't join the customs union anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable. So, so, so from, from Putin's point of view, what actually should we give him? Should we actually say, OK, it's over with, with Ukraine uh, uh, becoming part of the European Union, you can have it? Or, to put it uh, uh, even bluntly, if, if Putin is marching uh, to Kiev, which still is possible, what, what, what are we going to do against that? We can't stop him. We are not going to take part in this conflict. After Ukraine is not a NATO, uh, NATO member. Uh, uh, we're not going to defend uh, its independence, as we should have done because of the Budapest Agreement of the 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, we aren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. There are some American uh, mm -hmm. uh, training officers now active in, in the western mm -hmm. part of Ukraine mm -hmm. to train mm -hmm. the Ukrainian army, which is a complete mess. Mm -hmm. But it won't help them if they really have got to fight against uh, the Russian army. No. So what can, what can we actually do? Well, we should make it clear that changing borders by military means in Europe is unacceptable. Uh, it's true, we mm -hmm. will not use our military. But I don't think that would be the wise thing to do anyway. But we should make it as difficult as, as possible for Putin to do that. We've uh, got the sanctions. We impose For them. example, with the sanctions. Mm -hmm. But there are, other, uh, there are other means. Isolating Putin and isolating his government is something very, um, well, very difficult for him. Because he sees Russia as being one of the biggest countries in the world, which should have a an influence in the world which should be accepted everywhere in the world as an equal partner to the biggest other powers in the world, the United States and others. Now, uh, that means that you have to be in all the bodies where decisions are being made. The fact that he was <coughs> ousted from the G8 is a blow because suddenly he is not in there anymore. Uh, the fact that he, is not, he has invited all heads of state and government to come on the 9th of May uh, to Moscow, and uh, only the North Korean leader and uh, maybe some others will accept, yeah. is a blow. He had hoped on that summit that there would be a sort of Asian summit under Russian monitoring with South and North Korea coming together, the leaders, China, Japan, nothing of that. Uh, when he was sitting alone in um, in, in Australia, was it? Mm -hmm. uh, and the at, the at the summit there, the Asian summit, and all the leaders were having lunch together and Putin was sitting on his own on the table. That is terrible. So a country that wants to play a role in the world, and it should play a role in the world, by the way, uh, Russia, if it is not accepted in the world, it's a terrible book. So that is one, one way I think you can certainly make, make it difficult. But it can also be to his advantage. 
because uh, many Russians, uh, Putin's support still is 85 or 88 yes. percent. Uh, and of course, we don't know how thin or thick this support is. But it can also be that, that, that the ordinary Russian will say, OK, you're trying to destroy us because of these sanctions. We yes. can't have French cheese. I, I heard from, from some Dutch friends in Moscow yesterday that there are no uh, uh, patat friet uh, and in French fries anymore. Uh, you, you can't have them in the restaurant. So the whole, the whole menu uh, became Russian again. So it's yes. all for, for the Westerners in the expats. It's quite tough to be there. But, but also my Russian friends, some of them say that, are talking like that. Yes. They really think uh, a conspiracy is being started against them, not against Putin, because even people who took part in the protest movement of 2011 yes. are now supporting Putin. Yes, yes. No, that is absolutely true. And that will c continue to be uh, the case until mm. it gets too bad. Uh, already now, mm. a friend of mine in, in Russia, uh, who is a pro-Putin man, is squarely behind Putin, um, was telling me, you know, your sanctions you know, have not had any influence at all. But the counter-sanctions, they are hurting us. We, we, indeed, we cannot have fruit, vegetables, uh, medicine. Uh, whole factories have to close. Uh, fish uh, factory in Murmansk, which is getting fish from Norway and then remaking it in tins or whatever mm -hmm. they do with fish. They stopped work because the fish is forbidden to be imported. Um, that, in the end, hurts. And... Um, well, it will take some time. It will take maybe one, two years. Uh, so as Putin says himself, he was asked, Putin was asked in this telephone conversation with the nation, which we have every year, how long will it last, Mr. President? Uh, uh -huh. They but, tell but, us one year or two but, years. But the economy is deteriorating uh, every day. Rapidly, More yes. and more. Yes. And of course, we know that we have to, to suffer that. We do that for the greatness of Russia. Tjerpjeć, uh, as they so nicely say. And we have to have patience. But how long will it last, Mr. President? But, uh, so there's a certain nervousness, and at a certain moment, the situation becomes so bad that... Mm -hmm. but, but don't you think Putin, because by interfering in, in, in Ukraine, uh, he, he, he gave the, 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 the people, the, the Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine, promises. He promised them something. He can't retreat as easily now because it, it can cause his political death. Sure. Isn't there also a danger of Putin disappearing from the stage and being replaced by somebody else? It can be a hardliner, it can be a more liberal kind of politician. Yeah. Well, what, what can happen? Because we, we all know that Putin is somewhere in the middle. Uh, he is surrounded by all those FSB generals who we, we actually don't know anything about uh, the power elite. But we are sure that it's a very small group of people taking the decisions. Well, as you know better than anyone, everything can happen in Russia. Yeah. Uh, and every day something new happens which is totally unexpected. Uh, if you look at the past, how leaders were replaced, they were generally replaced by someone else from their inner circle. And uh, if you look at the, the circle around Putin, you can see that the members of the Security Council, for example, there's some 80%, or there are only 12 or 13 people, uh, only three of them are not yeah. from the KGB uh, or the F or from the security services. Yeah. Uh, so it is these people who, who I could imagine uh, at a given time, but not now certainly, yeah. but maybe in a year or more, yeah. may decide yeah. that you know, he's gone too far, yeah. he's taken maybe too much power to himself, he's yeah. become voluntarist, yeah. making his own decisions, and, and someone else may replace him. Yeah. What, what, it, what the change will be, I don't know. But for the time being, I don't think that, that I don't see that happen. But yeah. here are... More and we're going to, 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 to discuss it in a later round. You, you, you've been uh, a Dutch ambassador in the uh, UN Security Council. You've been uh, talking to, to your Russian counterpart. How, how is that kind of context going on? How does it regularly go? Is there a, a real intimacy or do you both always stay aloof? Well, I've, I've been a uh, permanent representative at the United Nations, but we were not members of the Security Council then. Uh, at that time, not. But I've, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of uh, negotiations with Russians, particularly on the Transnistrian issue, mm -hmm. which is a part, as you know, of, of Moldova, which has separated itself from Moldova and is supported by, uh, by Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, yeah, well, we were negotiating with Russia to try and solve that problem. Um, and... Um, 
Well, um, I don't know whether you want me to talk a bit about negotiations. Well, a bit about, about how but, it, but, it goes, because ma ma the yes. many Russian diplomats are, are very, in, are rather intelligent uh, diplomats. Oh, extremely they know intelligent. exactly what they do. Exactly, but they have other other means. There are a few characteristics, uh, many of course. But first of all, what you what you what you agree to, and and write in paper doesn't mean much. I think we have, well, tens and tens of agreements on Transnistria. Mm -hmm. So it's Minsk, none Minsk of them two, two also. None of them have implemented. Huh. So we have, we have Minsk 1, we have Minsk 2. We know what has happened to that. Uh, nothing is implemented. So you must realize that if you negotiate, um, you can sign something, but it doesn't mean uh, quite a lot. Um, Russia, um, I'm afraid to say, is also negotiating in another way than we Dutch would do. Um, when I was in the Soviet yeah. Union uh, in the 60s, I saw a movie which was fascinating about the preparations of the Russian delegation for the first conference they were going to after the revolution in 1921 to La Palo in Genoa. Mm -hmm. And the movie is about the delegation preparing itself for the negotiation. And they decided, what, what do we want to reach? Well, we want to reach this. How can we reach it? Well, we have to ask double. Mm -hmm. There will be outcry in the West, ridiculous import doesn't matter at all. We have time. The West has never time. We can say months on that. And they still stick to the position. And then after two months or three or so, they make a little concession. A fantastic concession by the Russians. Of course, there has to be another concession from the other side. We Dutch, you know, when we go into a negotiation, unfortunately, we think what would be reasonable to ask. We don't even ask mm -hmm. what, what do we want. Yes, we want this, but you can't ask that really, can you? I mean, <laughs> it's <laughs> unacceptable for the other side. You, so you, you ask something which, would, which sounds reasonable for the other side. The mm -hmm. other side, of course, thinks that that is double you want. Mm -hmm. So the result is very negative. So it's a, a difficult, it's not only with <laughs> Russians, but, but, you but have I, it with I, many nations. I was always told when I had some difficulties with, with the authorities, with the police or with the, with the secret service, if you started shouting and to intimidate them a bit, they always backed off. Yes. Isn't well, that yeah. also what, what uh, Angela Merkel is trying to do? I can imagine she's, she's in close contact with Putin. She speaks Russian as fluently. Uh, 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 she's probably the only Western leader who can get near him. Well, that's a general... Do you think they're they are honest towards each other? Is he saying, okay, I can't do it because I've got these people behind me who are forcing me to do that? Well, do that, that's you, the phenomenon you mentioned, uh, the shouting, is something which starts at our eastern border and, and gets more and more when you go further east. That is to say, if you meet someone uh, in whatever way, is he higher than I am or I, I, am I higher than... Um, find out first, mm -hmm. and the man with the shouts the most is, of course, the boss, until the other one shouts more, and then... Uh, mm -hmm. So that is, a, that is a sort of... Yeah, you, you get that. Not a usual But, but with Russians, I think... I'm, my, my experience is you should be very straight, mm -hmm. uh, very, uh, let's say, a sense of suave terremoto, very kind, and, and, uh, but very straight. Mm -hmm. This is what you want. Uh, you, well, you know, sorry, but this is it. And this is unacceptable. Well, we have to leave. So go to back tomorrow. And never, and yeah. never leave the negotiations without saying we'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. That is very as, important. As it happened uh, in Minsk, more or less. Yeah, I, I hope not. Don't, yes. don't, don't you think many Russians and uh, Michal Shishkin uh, uh, can say will, will say that uh, uh, Aksana also that they all Russians from the opposition people who are very critical towards the regime always say the West it, is too soft. And handling with with, yeah. with Putin, yeah. we are yeah. too polite. Yeah. Yeah. We are too naive yeah. a bit. Yeah. Yeah. We've been naive because the OB, OBSE in, in in Mariupol is still saying, okay, they they, they are trying to be so di too diplomatic, because they exactly know what's really happening. They they see uh, the troops coming in from uh, Rostov. Uh, on the Don, they see what's really happening, but they aren't going to make it public. So, so what's, what's the meaning of that? Of, of are, are, are we too diplomatic? Are we trying to stay Yeah, I think so too very careful. often we are. You have to be very firm, very firm with Russians. And they like that. They like a discussion. Yeah. It's not some, some Westerners think are afraid that if you have a, a sort of discussion uh, which gets a bit heated, mm -hmm. that that may be a bad... No, they love it. <laughs> and it, it's, you have to, you, have, yeah. you should never offend anyone, mm -hmm. but you will be very tough and strict. And afterward, you say, well, we had a nice discussion, Henry. Tomorrow we'll continue. Well, uh, if, if, if you were in charge, what, what would you um, advise Prime Minister Rutte 
if uh, uh, the, the, the research on the MH17 shows that actually the plane was shot down by a Russian book rocket uh, manned by Russian military, um, which means that actually Russia shot it down. What, what, what should, should we do? What, what could, could be the most threatening for Russia? To call back your, your ambassador from Moscow? Yeah, we should ask the, the, the culprits to be extradited. But probably that won't happen. That may not happen, but that's what we should ask. And or at least that they, they get punished. And, and when they don't do it? Uh, no, I don't think so. They will not extradite it, but we should assist them. And then, of course, because you get the problem. So you asked extradition. Hmm. They say, we never extradite Russians. And by the way, they are not the culprits. Uh, so we have to prove that they are the culprits. I don't know whether our Procureur General will be able to do that, mm -hmm. but hopefully he will. Um, and then, uh, well, I don't know what happens. Then, then is the question, what does the Netherlands do? Will they insist? Every meeting at, at a high level, we're still waiting for your extradition, or forget about it. And, and the experience is, uh, unfortunately, that you start to forget about things. Yes, and I think good that that's, uh, that's something Putin hopes for, because actually Holland is very... Uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, very close yeah. connected to Gazprom. Uh, yeah. We are the Gazprom, as it is yeah. called. We are a very important factor yeah. in, in uh, uh, sending gas all over Europe, which comes by the North Stream pipeline. Actually, we, we, are, we, are, we are bound to, to Moscow nowadays. Well, yeah, we are, of Aren't course, we restricted in, in, uh, in our maneuvers? Korea, are we? Restricted, because we, we are uh, very much we are, dependent. We are a country which produces gas itself, so yeah. we, are, we are less uh, dependent on this than others. But we have but, got long-term But on this phenomenon, you were right. We had this with Sturimans, if you may remember. It was a, a Dutchman uh, shot down in Georgia during the war by a Russian uh, missile, uh, which was proved. I mean, we, we was shown, we, we saw the missile and so on. And, uh, of course, we asked for uh, you know, an explanation by Russia and the punishment uh, Never heard anything about it. And, well, do you hear so anything about it? It just it flows away. And that's the, 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 the biggest danger. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll go on later on. Now let's um, I turn to uh, Michal Shishkin. Um, he first wants to read a text on the Russian soul. And uh, about the Russian soul, of course, it plays an, a very important uh, uh, a role in this whole discussion. I remember being in Moscow as a correspondent in 2008. I met Nina Khrushcheva, the granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, who wrote a book about Nabokov, imagining Nabokov. And when she told the audience in the hall in St. Petersburg that actually Nabokov didn't believe at all in the Russian soul, the public became angry. Khrushcheva told the public that actually the Russian soul is a sort of excuse for not doing anything, for staying passively. So that's why the Russian soul is also an important aspect of our discussion. I give the floor to you, Misha. Thank you very read much. Read your text, there will be subtitles. Misha is going to read text in Russian, so you can hear what a beautiful language it is. But it will be subtitled on the screen. <coughs> Actually, I don't believe in Russian soul either. Yeah? Thank you. I was just asked to write about this subject for this event. They did. Основы русской души. В 1913 году на экраны мира вышел фильм Атлантида о катастрофе океанского лайнера. Блокбастер того времени имел огромный успех, в том числе и у русского зрителя. Причем для проката в России создатели фильма специально сняли другую концовку, заменив happy end на unhappy end. Авторы знали, русский человек другой. В школе нас учили, что радио, лампочку, паровую машину и все остальное придумали русские. Потом выяснилось, что все это попало в школьные учебники во время гонений на космополитов при Сталине. Не знаю, что по этому поводу сообщают учебники теперь. В стране идет полным ходом русская весна, скорее очередная русская зима, 
и учебники снова переписывают. Наверное, введут новый главный школьный предмет – основы русской души. Русскую душу, кстати, придумали немцы. К тому моменту, когда русские задумались, кто они такие, понятие «русская душа» уже пару веков было термином западной русологии. А впервые это выражение встречается в середине 17-го столетия в книге Адама Алиария, в которой немецкий путешественник в Московию описывает, как он осматривал православную церковь. «Над дверьми был изображен страшный суд». Здесь монах, между прочим, показал нам человека в немецком одеянии и сказал, и немцы, и другие народы могли бы спастись, если только у них были бы русские души. На дворе 21 век, а не 17 -й. Но во имя русской идеи и русского мира льется кровь, пытают людей, берут в заложники, Расстреливают, разрушают дома, сбивают самолеты. И вот закрадывается крамольная в новой Российской империи мысль, что никакой русской души нет. Есть банда казнокрадов, захватившая в заложники страну. Есть изолгавшееся телевидение. Есть зловонная дума, испускающая удушливые законы. Есть страх очень одинокого стареющего человека в Кремле. Есть всенародная привычка лизать на частственный сапог. Есть Крым наш. Есть пасконная вера в дьявола и бесов, принявших обличия США и европейцев. Есть всеобщее чиновненное воровство. Есть суды, в которые лучше не соваться. Есть борьба с коррупцией под гоголевским лозунгом «Не по чину берешь». Есть унижение человеческого достоинства во всем, что тебя окружает – дороги, образование, медицина, пенсии. И есть население, которое все это терпит и следует за своим фюрером в катастрофу. На глазах у изумленного мира моя страна совершает самоубийство. Русские другие, им нужен Unhappy end. Спасибо. Actually, Михаил, these are the most depressing words which have been spoken this evening, because actually you don't see any solution. Actually, I'm conflict. optimist. You see, having five children makes one optimistic. Yeah? <laughs> But what to do? You, 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 you were talking about uh, Krim Nash, Krim is ours, which you can hear in Moscow, you could hear, you could hear in Moscow after the annexation of the Crimea. Um, how is it with your friends, with your relatives in Moscow? You told me a, a few weeks ago that even you've got inside your family, people are thinking absolutely different about the situation. How does it work? Because probably, you, of course, you're not the only one. Look, my mom was Ukrainian. My father was Russian. And sometimes, it's horrible to say, but sometimes I think, God, it's good that they died. Not to see how Ukrainians and Russians are killing each other, murdering each other. You see, it's, I think, absolutely mean thing to let our people, really, we were brothers. Such family like mine, there were millions, this mixed mixture, mixed families, Ukrainian, Russian, millions and millions. And how mean must the, uh, how to say it, the imposter, I wouldn't say president, he's an imposter, <coughs> in the Kremlin be, to save himself by starting this war, by preparing this war. Why, why did they start? I don't think war? it was about some ideas of uh, Euro-Asiatic 
common market or customs. No. Look, when he was watching TV, horrible pictures about the ending of Mubarak or Saddam Hussein, it was just, you see, like greetings from the other planet. The destiny sent him greetings. It's far away. Mm -hmm. But after uh, Yanukovych yeah, had to fly from Kiev, it was already the real danger for him because Yanukovych, it's not far away. He belongs to the same gang. They are together. It's his gang, it's his guy. And what did he do? What all dictators do in this case? Yeah? They use, they misuse the best feeling which people have. The patriotism, the love to their country. Look, my father, he was six when his father was arrested in by Stalin, Stalin regime, yeah. And he died somewhere in, in uh, Gulag. And then all his life he had to uh, write in this uh, questionnaires. My, my father died and he was always afraid that people will come to know that he is the enemy of the, the son of the enemy of the people. And when the uh, war came and Stalin, the dictatorship, really felt, oh, it's dangerous. Yeah? Suddenly, what people heard all over the country, bratia y siostre, brothers and sisters. We have our common home country. It's homeland, отечество в yeah, let's defend our homeland. They were misusing people like my father, who went voluntarily by the army, and he was on the Baltic Sea in a submarine. He was 18. Can you imagine? 18. He was a child. Yeah? But he was fighting, defending his home country against the evil. But in reality, he was misused by the, another, by the other evil. Because fighting for his home country, he was defending this slave regime who killed his father. And what is happening now? The same thing, bratia y siostre, brothers and sisters. Fascists are already in Kiev. They are coming. Yeah? We have to defend our country. It's again. Where is the border between the regime and the homeland? In Russia, it's not so easy to say. Look, this, uh, I don't know what, what was it, this clip, this video clip, yeah? About the Russian occupant. For normal people, it, it sounds, it looks absurd. But for Russians, it's contagious. Because this is Russian fascism pure. The uh, propaganda minister uh, Goebbels said, yeah, the Nazism, the, the national so socialism could be understood only by blood. He meant by German blood. Yeah? For uh, Russians, for Americans, for Dutch people, German nation, uh, Nazism it, well, it was not contagious. But for Germans, it was. The same thing is now in Russia. So actually, you, you call uh, Putin a dictator. You actually, you call Russia a fascist state. Not, uh, OK, yeah. So, so, so how, where will it all end? Do you really think Putin is, 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 about, um, is really thinking about waging war with the West, or there, is it only a retracting? There are two retracting? questions I would like to have the answer to. Yeah? What to do, when <laughs> will it end? Yeah? Look, I just feel, as a writer, suddenly I feel what the German writers felt in the late 30s. This feeling of, to be absolutely helpless. Literature failed. Literature can stop the war. It can. And the German writers had just to watch their people, their readers, 
yeah, following the Fuhrer into the catastrophe. The same much? thing is in Russia, absolutely. Yeah? The great Russian literature could not stop uh, during the revolution and after that, could not stop yeah, uh, that uh, Russia became be becoming uh, the, the whole country into gulag. Yeah? It helped to survive in gulag, but it could not stop the war. Yeah, the same thing now is in Russia. What can you do f just watching your people following this Führer into Russian catastrophe? Yeah. Just, I told myself, I cannot keep silent. If I keep silent, it means I support. The only thing I could do is not keep silent. What are other Russian writers doing? Because you're, you're living abroad, you're living in Switzerland most of the time, you used to go from time to time to Moscow, but there are lots of, there are still a few writers uh, uh, continuously living in Moscow. Paris Akudin, the detective writer, he emigrated, he's, he's never going, he told an interviewer that he's never going to return to Moscow, yet he's staying in France. Uh, but there still are people like Priliepin. The first thing for me is when really talented, gifted yes. people are supporting this fashion, are supporting this regime, like Priliepin. It hurts. I can imagine. Because at the other side, in Ukraine, there are lots of writers, actually the whole intelligentsia is supporting Maidan. And Yuri Androhovich, who's been writing, he is one of the leaders of the intellectuals uh, behind the Maidan. So uh, We just have to learn from the history. Yeah? There is two possibilities. Yeah? Just to give up, like Stefan Zweig, he could not do anything. He committed suicide in exile. Yeah? And uh, we have writers like Thomas Mann, yeah, who tried to make his speeches on the radio for uh, the whole world and for Germany, showing that not, Ger not all Germans are fascists. There is other Germany. That is what uh, writers could do now, show that there is other Russia, and we should wait till the Putin's regime will fall. But we don't know when it will fall. It will. You see, <laughs> no, dig uh, no war yeah, went forever. Every, every war stopped in the history. And no dictator lived forever. Every, every dictator disappeared one day. The problem is, the, uh, this pyramid created by Putin is very stale, very solid. Yeah? Because there is no uh, opposition in Russia anymore, the opposition is absolutely paralyzed and helpless. The population, uh, thanks to the propaganda, is loving his Führer and he is uh, ready to suffer and to sacrifice for, for the war because people are in the war. Mentally, they have the war already now, not in the future. And in the war, they uh, must help the, uh, the, his Putin yeah, to defend the homeland from the fascists, from, from, from European, from Americans. Yeah? But, but during the Soviet days... And so, 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 sorry, I just wanted to tell about this term. It, it's very stable as all, but it has just one mistake. Yeah? The moment, the crucial point of the changing the first guy. Because it's like a feudal system, it's not, uh, not, uh, is st the stability is not on the rules, on the, on the uh, law. It is the stability of the personal obeying your boss from the, uh, <coughs> uh, till, the till above, till Putin. Yeah? And if Putin is away, I don't know, maybe a meteorite will come. Nobody knows, yeah? And then this pyramid will collapse in hours, yeah? Russian Empire, 1917, collapsed uh, in some months. Soviet Union, 91, collapsed in three days. Yeah, Putin Empire will collapse in hours. And then all these supporting clans yeah, will fight each other, and then we'll have Russia collapsing, absolutely. It's my 
prognose. I don't know what will happen. In five or ten years, we will meet again and see what happened in reality. And then uh, this, the end of the empire, the remains of the empire will uh, just dissolve. Yeah? It will be the last dissolution of the Russian empire. Chechnya will go, Siberia will go, I don't know. Then we'll have some small you know, fighting each other uh, countries, with maybe with dictators like Tajikistan after the uh, dissolving of this Soviet Union. Maybe some places like St. Petersburg or Moscow where a lot of well-educated people with European values in mind, maybe they will uh, uh, manage to create something like democratic societies. We will see, but if this happens in uh, one month or one year, there will be so much blood. If it happens in 20 years, there will be so much blood. Sorry. So the soon the better, because after collapsing, there will be time for uh, establishing a new Russia. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in Russia, and, and, and we, we should admit that all of us, there are so many decent and intelligent people. Most of my friends, they work in Moscow at universities. They are political scientists, they are nuclear scientists, they are mathematicians. They exactly know what's happening. And they are sitting at home, they're not doing anything. They're afraid after the murder on Boris Nemtsov. They were really uh, 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 shutting themselves up in their apartment because they, some of them were thinking the pogroms were going to start. Who should, who no. from Russia the decent part of the Russian population? It's a fantastic country, it's a really wonderful country for thieves, for criminals, and for honest, good people fighting the criminals fighting the thieves, fighting the regime, for heroes, like people who are ready to sacrifice everything, their family, for democracy. We're wonderful people, no, like Navalny. He is ready to go to prison, he is ready to sacrifice his family. Yeah? But not all people are ready to sacrifice their families. Most of people just want to have their job, to have their family, to earn money for their children, to give their children future. They are not ready to be heroes. But one day in Russia you can't stay just between. One day you have to make your choice. Are you with the gang or are you with the heroes? And uh, that's really the tragedy of Russian people. And they, they what do they do? They immigrate. Well, uh, can I add to this, because it's a very important point also for me. Um, it happens so that I've lost quite many of my friends because they were murdered. Anna Politkovskaya, Natasha Estemirova, um, Stanislav Markelov. These are people who I knew very well as friends. The last person who I lost was Boris Nemtsov, because I came to know Boris when he was nobody, when he was a physician in Nizhny Novgorod, one of these bright intellectuals. And I have known him for years and years. We disputed a lot. One of my last interactions with Boris was very tough, to be honest, because I condemned, I can honestly tell, I condemned his uh, ways to mediate with the Kremlin with regard to Bolotnia Square, which happened to be uh, a collapse of everything. What, what did he do? Can you explain a bit about it? He mediated with the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done mm -hmm. that. And the last text message which I sent to him during that period of time was, but is if you are leading people away just make sure that you will lead them to the point. He always responded to my messages. Mm -hmm. We argued a lot, but we respected each other. And uh, when he was murdered, brutally murdered, I was absolutely appalled. It, I was, it was a shock for me, also the way how 
Everything was uh, presented to the audience, so to say. It was a big show with his torso naked, absolutely humiliated. And everybody accepts that, also the West. The worse, the better. Excuse me, you should also think about your own responsibility. Because I remember one of my last meetings with Anna Politkovskaya, we were on the same flight to Stockholm, where we attended the same conference. And can you imagine, she was sharing me, uh, with me uh, two things. The first thing that her daughter let you know that she was pregnant. And Anna was uh, about to become, in a few months, to become a grandmother. And they filled her with exaltation and with happiness. Believe me, Mikhail, none of us wants to sacrifice our lives. I would prefer to stay with my life, with my family in Russia, rather than live abroad. But it happened so. The same with Anna, the same with uh, Boris, who admired love, who enjoyed life, who was uh, full of life. He never wanted to become a martyr. And the same with the rest of the people who are actually lost now forever. And there is one very telling about um, the problem of uh, misunderstanding in communication, different layers of communication. Yes, because, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. It's very important with Russians, with us, to be straight. But it's always important to be straight with people if we want to be understood, you know. But at the same time, um, once I remember it was in Brussels, I was told another, by another senior official uh, in the European Commission that, you know, uh, we really don't know how to deal, oh yes, how to deal with Putin. Why? Because, you know, he gets very angry very fast. And is your problem not to make him angry? You know, I've been interrogated by FSB a lot. I was threatened by FSB a lot. You know, there is one very special reason. I'm telling you from my experience of being interrogated by the FSB many times. Don't show your fear. Just stay calm. That's it. Don't um, try to make someone who is not very nice to, be, to look like a monster. Because you are creating this kind of dragon. And another very important way, again, so this is just a recommendation. I don't know whether I am going to be heard this time, but in order to fight someone really nasty who you don't approve of, is uh, very important to be straight and to tell the truth. And if there is a side opposing to this nasty creature, like Ukraine now, don't try to see it as something absolutely gorgeous. It's not. Because by seeing, by omitting really nasty things, because the OEC monitor and mission uh, do, has, uh, do have uh, a lot of internal reporting. Yes, that's true. But they also have a lot of internal reporting about Ukrainian military being absolutely hostile towards civilians, Ukrainian citizens. I do know quite a lot about recommendations by the UN and Red Cross to stop this uh, absolutely criminal okay. politics of uh, blockading, blockading the east of Ukraine and depriving people of means of survival. So this is a recommendation. And in order to fight fascism, despotism, uh, whatever else, it's necessary to adhere to your own principles. Yes, because when I was on the way to this place, we came across some um, events, some rally, 
and uh, my friend translated the mottos of the rally. The rights, the human rights exist for all. Yes, human rights exist for all. They are not created, they just exist. <clears throat> and the main human rights is the right to life. Oksana, I've got to interrupt you because we have got another subject still. And I'd like to ask um, uh, Adrian also, because uh, you have been in contact with uh, President Poroshenko in the past. You always uh, uh, tell that he is a, a trustworthy person. You can deal, do business with him. He's delivering. And what you're saying also about the Ukrainian army, that there isn't, there isn't order at all. So probably parts of the army are not listening to uh, uh, the president. Well, volunteer battalions are volunteer. not under control. What, what does it say about Poroshenko's future as a leader of his country? Well, indeed, Poroshenko is a man who wants to get things done. Uh, that happens with other leaders as well. But in, in this case, at least in the experience I have with him, he made things done. If he says something, he does it. Uh, he built up an empire, he can do something. Um, he's starting, what is the, one of the problems in, in Ukraine, contrary to Russia, is that oligarchs there are still, have still political power. In Russia they have very little, Putin has settled that, more or less. Uh, not in Ukraine. We have had the, the example with Kolomoisky, who was one of the, one of the oligarchs who had his own army in the east, who was appointed governor of Donetsk, I think, or what else was it? Um, he's been dismissed. Yeah. And that's the first. Uh, Poroshenko showing that you know, this is unacceptable. Yeah. So I don't know how far he'll get. He has a very difficult situation. He, he has to do everything at the same time. He has to, to fight corruption. He has to fight a war. Uh -huh. He has to reorganize the state of Ukraine. Uh, it's quite a task. Is it possible to win with that amount of problems? Well, I hope he well to win, win, win. You need time and you need to have one after the other. But I would like to ask a question. Is that possible already or not yet? Yes. <laughs> In the, in the, well, as a diplomat, you're still thinking of solutions of a problem. Um, Putin now and then uh, says, well, Ukraine is not a country, really. First of all, you have the East, which is, of course, very Russian, and you have the, the West, which was under Poland and, and Lithuania, and part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so on. D does any of you think, the two of you think, that dividing Ukraine and giving Putin what Putin is and leaving the rest would, is, is a solution? It will be very difficult to factor it, but theoretically speaking, would that be a solution in the end for Putin or for, for Russia? Well, it's not, I, a, it's I, not I a solution for Ukraine, I think. I can't speak on behalf of Putin. I'm an absolutely different person with an absolutely different perspective on, on, on everything. But you understand <laughs> but, him so well. But, but at the same time, I, uh, to some extent, I doubt that uh, he really wants to get the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, he wants to get Ukraine? Well, in what way? But, you know, um, another very complicated reality of Ukraine is that you might hear the same opinion of their state also from Ukrainian patriots. Yeah, that this is a very diverse state, which is, and this is true, this is a very diverse state. Uh, before that, we were... Uh, discussing with you that even such close cities like Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporozhye, also very, which have very much in common, they are both industrial, they are huge cities, they also play very important role, but they are different even at the mental level. So people from Zaporozhye actually can easily tell that this person is from Dnipropetrovsk and vice versa. Another very important thing, okay, we are speaking about Donbass, uh, about Donetsk and Lugansk. Mariupol is Donetsk region. Uh, it belongs, yes, administratively to Donetsk region. But uh, do, well, people here in the Netherlands know that um, something like 16 huge settlements in Donbass are inhabited by ethnic Greeks who speak Greek as their native language. 
And this is the reality of Ukraine. And when I, for instance, uh, lived for several days in one of such Greek villages, the population of which is not several hundreds, it's 11,000. <laughs> you know, it's a huge city in European standards. Actually, I heard them using Greek while talking among themselves in their families. And they tell that under no circumstances they will accept any other language as their first language because their first language is Greek and their second language of communication with everybody else is Russian. And it should be respected. A new party in the war. <laughs> We've got to finish, but first we're going to, to watch another video of, made by the Theatre of Wrong Decisions. And it's, uh, it's, uh, this theatre is a fusion of visual arts and theatre, and it, it makes clips which are closely related to similar situa situations in uh, Shakespeare's play. And, and they made, uh, and actually it's, it's Ingrid Rollema, uh, they made a, a video now uh, combining Macbeth and the death of Nemtsov. So let's have a look at it. Murders have been performed too terrible for the ear. Now they rise again and push us from our stools. Blood will have blood. Which brings us back to, to Boris Nemtsov. Um, uh, Aksana, who do you think uh, is behind the killing? Is, we, we, of course... I can tell uh, with, uh, with my own level of certainty. I do attribute his death to Ramzan Kadyrov. Like the murder of Anna Politkovska and my friend Natasha Istemirova. Because... Kadyrov is such a wild guy who cannot be controlled by the Kremlin because anymore. Because Kadyrov is a, um, a spoiled baby yes. with a, a very limited uh, uh, understanding of what limits are. Because he was born with inclinations to violence. And the only person who was able to control him was his father. And then he found another father, who he called the Allah, who is Vladimir Putin. Okay, that's clear. Uh, how, how should the West... You were criticizing the West because it, it reacted very, very softly on this murder. How, what, what should the West have done, from your point of view, after themselves murder? Because I, I saw on Facebook that last weekend uh, the German and French ambassador we're laying against uh, every day flowers are being let uh, at, at uh, this uh, certain point on the bridge near the Kremlin, and uh, during night time they are they are uh, they disappear. People in black coats arrive, and they clean the streets. And the next morning, opposition adherents probably it's paid because a rose nowadays costs more than five euros in Moscow. You know, um, the only way to influence Putin. Who is there, who might, I assume, yeah, I assume that he might be kind of annoyed with his uh, spoiled baby. Mm -hmm. uh, because baby eats too much. And the appetite keeps growing. Uh, so it must be, it must be done whatever possible at whatever costs to close any possibilities for Ramzan Kadyrov to travel, to use bank accounts, to send his horses to races, and do everything which he uh, is used to doing. And besides, there is another thing. If we are talking about last dictators of Europe, 
Chechnya is in Europe and he is the dictator. And he is one of the scariest persons and politicians, which who was also created because for a very long time the world tried to find some justification for his existence as a politician. You know, I remember uh, one of such, well, one of my meetings in Barcelona, at the University of Barcelona, it was a huge uh, conference on uh, um, contemporary wars in Europe, uh, in which people from uh, Belgrade and uh, <coughs> all other conflict areas participated. And it was exactly at the time, in 2006, uh, when uh, Ramzan Kadyrov was uh, gaining more and more uh, confidence yes, in his moves. And I remember, I was asked a question about him, and I told her, <laughs> don't be surprised if uh, you ever meet him in your streets wearing a nice uh, suit with a bow tie. Because he can be also easily taught, like he was taught to use some Russian constructions properly, with best professors from uh, from Moscow. Mikhail Shishkin, what, what do you think is the murder, the killing of uh, Boris Nemtsov, the beginning of a series of killings of adversaries of the regime? It could be, it could be, but I think concerning the worst, the West, yeah. The problem is that Russia and Russians mentally, they are already in war with the West. Mm -hmm. The West is not. The West will be never prepared for the war. And in this war, Russia, I mean the Russian regime, Putin's regime will uh, always win. Because the West will always go back and will be never prepared to push the red button, to dive for, for some Mariupol, yeah? And uh, sure, I wish my country always victory. But what is victory? What is the defeat? See, every victory of uh, fascists, every victory of Hitler was a defeat for German people. And uh, the final defeat of Germany was the great victory for Germans because they showed the whole world how the nation can be resurrected yeah, without this idea of the war, yeah, without fascism on mind. And so I wish my country, I wish my country victory. Adrian Jakobovic, what do you think? What, final saying, what is to be done? Well, Putin might win, might win battles, but I don't think he'll win the war. Eventually, it will turn against him, and he may conquer a little bit more of Ukraine, but in the end, I don't think um, Ukraine will be subdued. So we will have... Uh, a frozen conflict. We don't know exactly along what lines. I think the sanctions will go on, of being even stronger, and I think eventually he will have to give in. Can we in the meantime expect something happening in the Baltic countries? No, I don't think so. I think the main, the main uh, focus is now on Ukraine. And I was, as I told you, I was uh, two weeks ago in Kiev, <clears throat> I talked with a number of people, and um, they were all convinced that Russia will take military action again uh, after the 9th of May. The 9th of May is, the, of course, the big celebration of, um, of the war, of the end of the war, and that is a festivity which should not be troubled by, by military action. Just as we had Sochi, the Olympics, uh, which had to be in calm, and afterwards you can do something. But after the 9th of May, uh, they expect that uh, the military action will take place, and then there are all kinds of possibilities. Putin himself has, by the way, has uh, said the other day that um, we have strengthened uh, Morshna uh, powerfowly our garrison in Sevastopol, 
that's what I heard also in uh, Ukraine. And you can do with that what you want. You can. But uh, w w people think what is important might be important for Russia is at least to get a land link over land to the Crimea, uh, which is about 180 kilometers from the front line now to the Crimea. Now you have to, to fly over the sea in order to reach it, or you have to t take these little boats uh, along the Straits of Azov, which are, uh, can't, f can't go, and it's too stormy weather, etc. So that's an uh, attractive uh, thing to do. And how to do it is different fantasies. Thank you. We, we've got to finish. And I can imagine that there are some people <coughs> on the floor who would like to, to ask a question to one of our guests. Whom can I hand? Of course. Hello. Um, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm, I'm a citizen of Holland. Okay. <laughs> An entrepreneur, as Mr. Jakobovich would say. <laughs> and I'm really angry. I'm really angry. Because what I hear from Russian TV is that you have debates there. Debates. Probably everybody forgot what it meant. It meant that you have people from both sides and they have a discussion en public. We don't see that. We don't see it here. We don't see it on Dutch TV. We see it nowhere. But we see it on Russian TV. On Russian TV, you have debates. Mr. Lavrov had people from Novaya Gazeta, or was it an Echo Moskvi, or, you know? He, he is sitting there at the table, and he can be asked questions from opponents. Not here. This is very strange. You are citing something that Putin said today about, uh, you know, all the, all, it's all Russia, Kazakhstan, it's all Russia. Why don't you tell us about the Wolfowitz Doctrine? In 1990... Why don't you tell your name? My name is Hugo Janssen. Oh, okay. Mr. Wolfowitz wrote that... Question. No. Mr. Wolfowitz, no, because this has no use. This has no use to give propaganda to us. We are risking a war. We are risking 140 million people in Russia, their lives. It will happen, to them will happen the same as what is happening to the Donbass. Why? Be because Mr. Putin said, be because Mr. Putin, uh, Mr. Wolfowitz said, we may never tolerate Russia uh, uh, going up again. That was 1992. In 2000, I have a question. Why, Mrs. Oksana, I, I sympathize with you because I think you're a honest person, but you have colored glasses. Mr. What, what, Nemtsov was what do you say? vice premier under Yeltsin. Yeltsin gave away Russia. He gave it away. And your friend Nemtsov was helping him with that. Yet, he, somebody killed him. Somebody killed him. And it's great, it's big, 10 days, the papers were full of it, full of it. 12, 12 members of parliament have been killed in, in Ukraine in the last 10, 10 weeks. Nobody of these people ever heard about it. Okay. Okay. Journalists, okay. I will ask. why, 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 why are you so biased? Why do you bring us war, can you, why? Can you stay calm, please? Yes, I can stay calm, but there's, we are in that, we are in 1915 or 14. There's a new war coming, and you're okay. helping it. Please, uh, being biased. shut up. <laughs> Please shut up. I, am <laughs> I can be very tough. Uh, well, uh, if you want to have a dialogue, you shouldn't behave as a puppet. Yes, in the circus. That's one thing. Another thing, my friend Boris Nemtsov, like uh, quite many other people who were, uh, have been killed, actually did a lot of things, including telling the truth. Also seeing and looking into your own eyes when we were not hurt, as I told. As for these killings and weird uh, suicides which do exist in uh, uh, Ukraine, you have no right to shout at me, Mr. Entrepreneur, because I do speak about it. Good. And uh, shut up. NSA, shut up. NSA does not speak about it. Shut up. And be polite. Be European. You know, demonstrate. Media, tell it to us. 
Well, why should you, why do you behave in such a stupid way towards me? If your media doesn't speak about it. Another question, please. I can't see over there. Excuse me, Michelle. Um, one very interesting thing. Like a few days before coming here, I wrote my article on the recent murders in Kyiv of uh, a journalist and writer, Alice Buzina, and some ex-politicians from Virhovna Rada. From on Russian. the party. From Russian. Well, more or less. More or less, yeah. yes, but in a very similar circumstances. Both were murdered. Uh, there is another very important misconception. So still my article is being reviewed. Whether it will be published in Finland or not. Why? That's the reason. Uh, it's very complicated. You know, because when I explain to my readers in Europe that Alice Buzina can't be called a pro-Russian. You know, he can't be called a pro-Russian because Actually, he was a pro-Slavic Union, so he was a lot more complicated than that. But this kind of notion is very difficult to explain, I'm told. But when I'm telling that Alice Buzina was the person who was uh, uh, very absolutely crazy about Tsarist empire, about uh, nobility of uh, their 19th century, about their uh, military etiquette and everything. He looked like a person from the past. So it's nice understandable. Then I tell, but what is the reason if there is a, just the atmosphere of impunity now also for these crimes? And this makes the situation in Ukraine very, very unstable. You know, when I hear about President Poroshenko and when I hear my Ukrainian friends speaking about him, they tell me when he came to power, when we voted for him, so we voted for someone who will resolve the conflict. Because it was his uh, motto to stop the war, to end the war. Yes, because the war had been initiated by different people. So, and he's falling short of people's expectations. So people, people in Ukraine do lose hope in him. Also because of this atmosphere of uh, violence, of lack of control over volunteer battalions, and over uh, because of these political, uh, political murders. When I attended political trials in Odessa together with the OEC and UN observation missions, which was a farce, it was a complete absurdity. And I was, when I was leaving it together with the OEC observers, I was asking them, what have we witnessed? And an American responded to me, Oksana, don't be surprised, this is Ukraine of now. <clears throat> and we shouldn't <clears throat> close our eyes to that if we want to help Ukraine and if we want to stop the conflict. There was a question over there. Uh, my name is Catherine Guizan. I'm a Swiss-American academic with two Dutch grandchildren. This is why I'm here tonight. Thank you very much to our distinguished Russian guests. I am in a strange paradoxical situation because I have taught in Russian universities in the last two years, lately on the topic of after genocide, the politics of reconciliation and justice. And I find I have been able to engage with many students and Russian, uh, Russian citizens on the situation of Ukraine. And not once have I heard the same thing. And so I would encourage any of you who have contacts in Russia, don't disconnect. Like our journalist friend told us, Russia is not Putin, Putin is not Russia. If you can go, go. Uh, and I, I have one question, though. You never told us what you found in the prison. What were the conditions in the prison you visited? 
Actually, I immediately reported on that also to the OEC observation mission and inside Ukraine, when I returned to Ukraine to local journalists in Zaporozhye and then in Kyiv. Then I brought the news to the Latvian television and it was also uh, broadcast there. So what I saw there um, <clears throat> was the compound uh, of the SBU uh, of Donetsk. SBU, this is the security uh, police of Ukraine. And it was uh, that compound was turned into their headquarters for their, well, for the military leadership of Donetsk People's Republic, where there was uh, two prison facilities uh, for uh, prisoners of war who were soldiers and officers of regular Ukrainian army and for volunteer battalions uh, from Donbass battalion funded by Mr. Kolomoisky and organized by Mr. Kolomoisky, uh, who, who were all taken prisoners uh, during one of their <clears throat> encirclements uh, uh, in, in June. So what I saw there, so uh, the conditions were not torturous. I was allowed, um, actually they released one soldier to me without any conditions. And I asked, on what conditions this soldier is released? Uh, they told, no conditions, this is a gesture of goodwill. So I got one soldier, like myself, yes? And uh, uh, then I was taken um, to the facility in the basement where the volunteers were kept. They were something like 100 of those people. Um, it was a huge... Uh, uh, underground or, well, some basement. Actually, it was, uh, it could be easily used for anti-air anti bombardments because it was very solid. And there were something like 100 uh, people there. Uh, I was allowed to, I wasn't allowed to talk to them, but I was allowed uh, to walk through them while they were standing in rows, they were nobody wounded or tortured. So, uh, and I was allowed to watch them closely. So, and uh, uh, I was led to stay as long as I needed there, on the only condition not to speak to them. Okay, um, then I was uh, um, showed her. Uh, where their food was prepared at that time, so there was no blockade still. So there's, um, so these volunteer, well, these uh, prisoners of war, so they were uh, fed from exactly the same canteen where their food was prepared for their guards, uh, which was located in the same uh, building. And then I was taken to another facility, which was uh, located in the same compound, but in a different building. And it was uh, on the second floor of a building. Uh, well, so later when I discussed it with uh, ex-officers of SBU, uh, well, before the conflict started, uh, I was told that it looked like kind of a library because there were shelves, and shelves were used uh, as uh, benches. And they were, well, books, and they were uh, some covers, well, so the people were asked to, to stand up and uh, the same procedure happened, so I was allowed to walk through them and uh, I, uh, well, I managed to, to, to see, yes, every, every man. Um, and then at that point there was a chief uh, of this uh, prison facility, so he was one of the prisoners of war, uh, an officer, Ukrainian officer, and uh, this time I was allowed to exchange some words with him. And uh, he told her, uh, he told that he was an officer, that he was uh, taken captive something like a month before that. Uh, that uh, well, so definitely he was. Uh, I was uh, accompanied by guards, uh, but he was told that they were uh, taken out for a walk. That they were. Uh, there were no additional uh, bars on windows. It was exactly the same windows 
as I was explained by uh, those who worked in that building be uh, before, it was uh, just the same bars uh, like they used to be. And uh, there was uh, no electric light because it was daylight coming, so it was something like 4 uh, p.m. when uh, I was taken in. Uh, so, and uh, definitely when uh, this young soldier was released, um, uh, so they immediately announced that it was an uh, unconditional release, that he was allowed to speak to me, that under no circumstances uh, he would be taken back, uh, so that he shouldn't be afraid, uh, but if he wanted to, 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 to talk uh, with me at a distance, so uh, he was allowed to, to move away. And then I asked what uh, I will what I should do with the man, yes, because, okay, so he, uh, he was asked uh, whether he agreed to be, uh, to be released. Definitely he agreed. Then he was asked about his plans. He told that uh, his only plan was uh, to return to his mother uh, and because he's the only son and to quit the army and never return to the military service. So it was, uh, well, he stated it immediately. And then I was told that uh, very soon there would be a Ukrainian officer coming, one of the mediators on uh, the procedure of uh, prisoners of war exchange. It happened to be uh, uh, Vladimir Rubin, uh, who I met in Donetsk. Vladimir Rubin came uh, together with uh, uh, his colleagues, another officer, well, he wasn't let into the premises of, um, of this SBU uh, where I was. He was waiting outside, but I was, well, I just took this soldier out of the compound and explained the situation to Vladimir Rubin and asked him to take the boy home, which he did. Is there time for a last question? No, the organization is saying. But maybe we can go and fit it somewhere down because otherwise the, our Sir, guests will miss their last buses home. Just one little remark. I'm one of the members from the theater of Rome decision. You gave me too much honor. It's my mistake. But the filmer is Marcel Moormans. It's not me. <laughs> Marcel Moormans. I invite you all for a drink. And thank for a drink. You Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being taking part in the panel.